Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey. Welcome to 2018. This is the show Change the World, where I like to in invite guests onto my show who have big, bold thinking and ideas and visions about the, the many problems we're facing in this world and who have really devoted their lives to, to tackling them. And so today I'm really delighted. Um, Thierry Vrain has come down from the Comox Valley, and I should say teeming miserable wet weather. It is. And to introduce you, Thierry is a retired soil biologist and a genetic engineer. He spent his entire research career with Canada's Federal Department of Agriculture, where you headed up a research department of 40 professionals in biotechnology. Lots of internal politics, I'm sure, but we won't go into that, right? You were vice president and president of national and international associations of soil biologists, and you were associate editor of several scientific journals in Europe and the USA. And a few years ago, you became concerned that the scientific studies were pointing um, the, you were thinking about the way genetically modified organisms were presented and not presented and whether it was a smokescreen or not, which I'll, I'll come to that in a second. And now you're publicly raising the alarm about the current excesses of industrial agriculture, including antibiotic contamination of engineered crops and food. So there's a lot there to get into. That's a lot. Start off with what is a soil scientist? I was a soil biologist. Soil biologist. I okay. studied microorganisms because most of them are tiny, tiny right. microscopic because they have to live in right. between the soil particles. And if I'm right, a handful of soil has a, a handful a of soil huge would have like billions, billions of, of microorganisms. Of microorganisms. So that's most of them bacteria. And how many of those have we identified and know what their function is? Very few. Yeah, of course. So if someone sprays a, a herbicide on the soil, and they're wiping, they didn't know how many of those they're wiping out. The herbicide, by definition, is to kill weeds, not necessarily okay, bacteria it, or insects or any right. other organisms in the soil. But it's going to have an impact on the so soil. So if you're killing the weeds, of course, you're killing the plant that feeds the biology yes. of the soil. You're correct. Yes. But not, it's an indirect thing, yes. Because my very first learning about soil was some time ago when I heard about the German scientist Justus Liebig in the 1880 or something like that, who said, wonder what's in soil, let's burn some to find out what's in it. Mm -hmm. And he found it was potassium, potash, and nitrogen, right? Yes. So he thought, well, that's, that's what it is. And that led to the modern fertilizer. It's like saying, wonder, what makes a human? Let's burn one to find out. <laughs> it's like we're going from biology to chemistry. Yes. You see, instead of the opposite. And you yes. lose all the complexity. Complete. So what was your main passion of, of focus of study? I was a nematologist. Nematologist. Nematologists okay. study nematodes. And a nematode and is? And a nematode is a microscopic worm oh. in the soil, a tiny, tiny worm. You can't see them. Wow. Microscopic. And they feed on bacteria in the soil. So in the soil, basically, the bacteria feed from the plants. Then the bacteria feed the nematodes. Right and the nematodes feed the mites and the bigger ones and then the bigger ones and the whole thing relies wow. from the plants yeah. and the bacteria. It's a beautiful system. That's soil biology. So if you're spraying a chemical on your crops that's an insecticide, it goes into the soil and it yes. will damage the life of the soil. If it's a herbicide, it will definitely damage yeah. the life of the soil. But if your herbicide is an antibiotic as well, yes. then it kills bacteria directly in the soil, on contact. So are some herbicides also antibiotics? Yes. Now, I didn't know that, right? No, not many people do. I know that, obviously, we use antibiotics for humans when we get infections. And I know that they're used in chicken raising to raise the eggs and stuff like that. It's but way, in soil? It's way more than that. 80% of all antibiotics are used in agriculture to fatten our animals, wow. pigs, cows, etc. And that does not take care of the herbicides that are antibiotic. Yeah. When you account with that, you're probably into 99% of all antibiotics used on the planet are for something else than humans. So the antibiotic resistance the, now we're getting infections in humans that are resistant to all an, known antibiotics. And so the hospitals are beginning to freak out. Yes. And it, how much of that resistance is caused by the use in the farms as opposed to use in the hospitals? Um, this is not my field of work, okay. but logically, common sense, I would say probably most of it. Wow. 
80 percent just to fatten the animals and then another probably 19 yeah. percent on top of it so when you're talking like one percent for humans yeah. and 99 percent for agriculture industrial wow. agriculture that so says something just to fatten the animals so the animals are growing an extra five percent ten percent more meat twenty percent i'm not sure but something like that faster faster oh growing up faster right so in all purely to make our food maybe slightly cheaper or something we're risking the entire benefits that antibiotics have given us to tackle yes infections yes we've been doing that for 20 to 30 years yeah how alarmed does that does that make you I, i've been incredibly alarmed yeah. enough to to do what i do to go around and, and go public absolutely yeah right. And I see the headlines, you know, the medical establishment is really concerned about losing antibiotics. Yes. This is a crisis. But, but they're not considering the millions of yeah. tons of pounds of, I'm not sure what the numbers are, of herbicide antibiotic that are applied yeah. in agriculture. So I hear the doctors being concerned that we're going to have antibiotic resistance venereal diseases that something like a, a caesarean section operation for birth would not be safe anymore because of infection. Ordinary injuries. We are going back to the Middle Ages. And the Middle Ages was really painful and horrible, to put when it bluntly. Infectious diseases were the most. The big killer. The big killers. Right. We've done away with those in the last, you know, in 50 years okay. because of that. So you, for 40 years or so, sat inside the federal government's <clears throat> department dealing with this. You saw how the scientists work. Yes. What is it that stops the knowledge being transferred from the medical alarm bells about antibiotic resistance to the, the farming and agricultural community? Why don't the two get connected? My first reaction is that I don't have a clue. I don't really understand. I don't know. It's, there's a lot of political influence, both at all levels, on the government yeah. and government employees, to tolerate, if not promote, industrial agriculture, chemical agriculture. Yeah. That is very clear. I was hired by the federal government. I did my PhD in the States, yes. and it was industrial agriculture. I learned pesticides. Right. Organic, organic biology, organic agriculture was really a sideline. So did you start, as you started to get more concern and awareness, and did, if you expressed that within the department? No. Oh. This, no, absolutely not. I was uh, your normal soldier and I'm not sure anything else would have been tolerated, right. uh, even though I was the head of the, of the department. Yeah. Um, I took it upon myself to speak about the technology, about genetic engineering. Yes. To allay people's fears. Yeah. Because it was a green technology as far yeah. as I was concerned at the time. Right. What it has become since is yeah. a different story. I mean, I've seen your resume, the huge list of scientific studies that you've yeah. published. So you, mm. you may be sitting here like an ordinary guest in a big blue sweater, but you've got a very impressive scientific background behind you. Mm -hmm. So if you're now raising the alarm bells around antibiotics and genetically modified organisms, there's real serious reason to pay very big attention. I right? think so. Yeah. So speak about the genetically modified side of this duality of worry. In the 1980s and 1990s, we, the academic, the, the scientists, you know, learned to use this technology basically to to import a gene from an, or an organism into plants and animals and humans. Which would never normally happen in nature. Which does not happen in nature. It happens with bacteria. They exchange genes all the time. That's why antibiotic resistance can spread right, extremely yes. fast. But not with plants and animals. It has to be vertically done, sex. Yes. You, know, you get your genes from your yes. parents. So where am I going? In terms of how you got interested in, 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 in when you were explaining genetically modified yeah, organisms, genetically, how it all started. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so basically some people invented the technology, it's just a lab technology, it's not a yes. big deal, it's not terribly complicated, where you can actually have that. So yes. when you are placing a new gene, so to speak, yes. from a bacteria, for example, to make human, ins of, to, to make, uh, uh, to make something in, in the plant that's a new trait, right. like it could be cold resistance. 
yeah. or it could be anything, well, or it could be herbicide resistance. Right. But the bacteria has learned how to okay. do. So the first one I remember hearing about was the famous transplanting of a gene from a fish into a tomato. I think it was. And that, yes. And that made people sit up because it's like, this, it's, is, this is strange. Right? It does sound strange. That's because the fish lived very, very deep yes. where the temperature is close to zero degrees right. centigrade. And how do they live there without their blood freezing? Yes. They must have an antifreeze protein. Right. Can we find a gene for that antifreeze protein? Here it is. Put right. it into the tomato. And you have a tomato that suddenly is more cold resistant. So now if I imagine I'm a scientist myself and I'm out of the Enlightenment and I'm thinking, this sounds wonderful. This sounds clever. It sounds skillful. A human advance. What's the downside? Well, the downside, you know, a lot of scientists are of that opinion, that it's, it's a good technology, it's green technology, it's used in a lot of labs every day. Yes. And there has never been any incident. The downside of it is that there is a chemical company that got hold of the technology and has used it to place, to import herbicide resistance into crops. Right. So, so we're talking about GMOs, right. so genetically whole, modified organisms. So a whole field now growing its crops and that is resistant to spraying herbicides. So they can spray herbicides and the plant won't die, but the weeds will die? Yes. And the difference is, is now you're not using a herbicide to spray weeds anymore. You are spraying the weeds, but you're spraying the crop. Yes. You are spraying a food crop. You are spraying yeah. canola. You are spraying corn. You are spraying soy. Right etc. You're spraying the crop. That has never been done before. Right. You cannot spray a crop with a herbicide. Right. So if I, if I don't think about that handful of soil with a billion organisms in it, and I don't know about it, I'm thinking, well, that's clever. It gives us more food. But if, as soon as I know that you've got a handful of, one handful of soil has got a billion living organisms in it, of which maybe one has been tested against this, certainly not a billion. Yeah. You could never test, you could never in a, no. You could never test for that. No, of course not. Then I'm thinking, oh, alarm bells. Well, you know, yes, possibly, but to me, the alarm bell is the chemical that has been sprayed on the food crop. What is it? Right, and, that as and, well. And is it innocuous? Okay. Are there any consequences to do that? So that's really what tickled me five years ago when I started to speak publicly. Right. And what is the most common chemical that's being sprayed? It's called Roundup. Well, Everybody knows Roundup. Everyone knows a Roundup. It's, you it's, can buy it in the garden stores. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly successful. Yes. It's the best herbicide we've ever had. Right. It kills all plants. It's wonderful. Right. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It works every time. It's the best herbicide we have. The most white, uh, you know, Non-selective, it's called. Yeah. It's a non-selective herbicide, so it kills everything. So I read a, a study in the Guardian newspaper recently, well, a report of a study that was saying that when Germans, people in Germany were tested, mm -hmm. three quarters of all Germans had Roundup in their blood as a level of five times the level of the safe in drinking water. Yes. That's actually the whole population. And simultaneously, although it's not really connected, there was another study that showed that there'd been a loss of insects. 75% of all insects have mm -hmm. gotten lost yep. over the last 25 years. Yes. And, and so now I've got some, rational, some irrational alarm bells ringing, like not knowing why this is wrong, but I know that to lose 75% of all insects is something seriously going wrong. And that's obviously going back to insecticides, not herbicides, right? But the same method of thinking as a farmer? It depends. If the herbicide is also an antibiotic, is it an antibiotic that is used as a herbicide and happens to kill plants? Yes, it's wonderful at killing plants. Yes. But it's also very wonderful at killing bacteria. And all animals, as far as I know, have something called a microbiome. They are oh. symbiotic organisms, okay, run by the digestive system, okay, which me, is full of bacteria. Stop Sorry, you. I'm let going me, fast. No, no, stop you a minute here, because I'm now aware of the microbiome in our human gut. Mm -hmm, the colon. The colon, and there's a lot of discussion, but I've never thought that, of course, every animal, every mm -hmm. bird, every, it has a microbiome, and an insect you. has a microbiome too. Yes. And so the chemicals are disrupting the nature of that microbiome in every butterfly and bird and insect. 
Okay. Spraying an antibiotic on food crops is not a good idea. Right. And spraying an antibiotic all over the landscape is not a great idea either. Because all animals are hit. Yeah. And by the way, there's also a study done in uh, California showing that 90% of Californians have also their body contaminated with that chemical, the active ingredient yeah. of that herbicide that we discussed. So what's the name of the active ingredient? Glyphosate. Glyphosate, okay. Yeah. And what are the, medic the known medical impacts or, you know, of... It depends who you're speaking to. What do the studies show? If you are talking of corporate studies, yes. which most of them are not accessible to the public because they are secret, according to those studies, which is what Health Canada and EPA go by, yes. the, the product is innocuous and the maximum residue limits are very high. Right that are allowed in the food, etc. Yes. If you're talking to people who look at public studies done in universities yeah. worldwide, particularly in Europe, the story is very different. Hmm. That is a very toxic chemical. Wow. But it's long-term toxicity. As you know, Monsanto has advertised it for a long time. The people working for Monsanto, although they deny it, have basically told the farmers and everybody has heard it, that it's yeah. so safe you can drink it. So, which is a stupid has, it been, is it, has it been studied to see if it causes cancer? Not with humans, no. Okay. No, Not we don't have epidemiological studies. We only have epidemiological studies with animals. Right, and what rats, is... Rats, etc. and it's very obvious that with most of the studies, there is something, it's, it's inflammatory and it causes oxidative stress. Right. And oxidative stress is one of the first signs of cancer. So, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, have they classified it? A, two years ago, they did. It'll be three years ago yeah. this spring. They did classify it. And it's good that you're bringing it up because really this is the top body in the world that assembles a team of experts yes. in that particular field. Yeah. They are not politically inclined at all, and they were very surprised when they classified glyphosate as a cancer-causing agent, a probable okay, cancer, probable. because we don't have yeah. human data. Right. So it has to be probable. Yeah. But they were, they were very clear and very... So I was reading a report on um, corporate studies in the, on drugs, different field of work, and then the, the corporate method was, because the studies are all private, they'll do 100 studies. If two show that the drug is safe and good, those are the ones they publish, and the rest are just thrown in the waste bin. And we never get to see, there's all the studies that said, no, it's got no results or it's harmful. Yeah, and I can't comment on that. But does the same, with your knowledge of corporate studies, funded by a corporation versus studies funded by the public government, there's you, a difference. You know where we are. We're exactly 40 or 50 years ago when the social cost, the health cost of the medical crisis caused by tobacco yes. were so big yes. that the government started to move slowly, very slowly at first, because there was a plenty of corporate studies showing that it's perfectly okay to smoke cigarettes. Yes, say even doctors smoke cigarettes, Of course, they? yeah. And this one is better than the other, yes. etc. But, you know, yeah. we, we, we remember that time. So I read yeah. recently that in the European Union, they were looking seriously at not no, withdrawing the license from glyphosate. Mm -hmm. They decided not to, but the French government, and I believe the Belgian government, says they're going to persist anyway with their own. So there you've got a whole government that thinks it's dangerous enough to merit withdrawing a license to use it. Does that have merit as an approach? Yes, I... I, I, you know, my, the reason why I'm public about it is because I'm really concerned about the food contamination. Yes. So obviously the next move is to regulate the hell out of this chemical okay. and ban it to be used on food crops, for God's sake. Yes. It shouldn't be that. Right. To use it as a herbicide when it's such a good herbicide, probably no more toxic than many others, maybe. So that's my position. But... I can't imagine a Minister of Agriculture deciding from one day to the next, sorry, 
to the farming community, yeah. you can't use this chemical anymore. They are going to go crazy. They are completely addicted. So when I interviewed Lana Popham, our British Columbia Minister of Agriculture, about this, she said that the farmers had told her that if they're not allowed to use glyphosate, they've got another chemical they use, which could be a lot worse. So she felt like really... The next generations of chemicals are right there, lined yeah. up. So yes, glyphosate soon, probably this yeah. year. And then it's Dicomba, which is a lot more volatile and will go all over the yeah. uh, landscape. And then, of course, there's Bayer, which is buying Monsanto, which yes. have their own technology called glyphosinate, mm -hmm. which is an antibiotic, right. except it's a natural antibiotic. It's made by a fungus. Okay. But an antibiotic so, is an antibiotic. So I presume, as a non-farmer, that the, the fundamental solution is for farmers to change to organic means of farming. Yes. <laughs> organic is a very big word. I don't know about... You well, know, certified the, organic. You're using no, yeah. chemi no synthetic chemical or pesticide inputs. In Germany, for example, um, and probably most places of Europe, glyphosate, Roundup, is used as a herbicide. You spray it on your field to get rid of the weeds, and yes. then you plant three weeks later. But so it's not completely banned. That would see. not be allowed under British Columbia's organic standards. Exactly. At all. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't know that all conventional or industrial yes. agriculture farmers yeah. uh, are ready to give up completely the way they've been farming and become organic from one day yeah. to the next. It's a nice dream, but... I once, I don't know if they still do it, but I read once that in Holland they were either doing or proposing to put a tax on, in order to encourage more organic farming, mm. they put a tax on pesticides and fertilizers, like put the money in a pot, and use it as a subsidy for farmers for three years to train them to be the transition and to help them if their income falls initially to get, because you've got to build up the soil fertility. That if sounds like a real democracy. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> and by the way, in the Netherlands, as well as France and Austria and Italy, are the ones, the countries that basically right. are banning glyphosate. So what can consumers do if they're watching this show and thinking, this is really alarming me, how can they... We haven't even touched on the chemical being sprayed on all grains and seed crops, which to me is the most alarming right. thing. Grains and seed crops, wheat, barley, yes. rye, etc., are sprayed, it's called chemical ripening, desiccation, are sprayed just before harvest. Okay. Lentils, chickpeas, Why beans. Why do they do that? For control of weeds, for one thing. It's just before and, harvesting. Yep. Yeah. And the second, if the wheat or the crop is not quite, quite mature, yes. it's quite, quite dry yet, then here it, here it is. You spray just before harvest. And one week later, when you harvest, the whole thing is very dry. You've killed the plants, but the grain is dry. It is chemical ripening. Wow. And now, that is even more residue mm. in the food. And so now you have, this is really, I mean, yes, yeah. GMOs are sprayed by definition. Yes. But the grains and seed crops that are sprayed. So now the seeds themselves that are being sown are yes. getting sprayed. So. I mean, obviously, that's the reason for buying the organic seeds that are open heirloom varieties that are not yes, sprayed, right? Yes, you could think of it that way. Yes. But I'm thinking of residues in the food. You yes. were asking me the question well, about what yeah. can people do? Make sure that your bread, your bread and your grains and all your seeds, which is really yes. a great deal of our nutrition, are organic, organic or yeah. not sprayed. Because I, I think by the time this show is, is aired, probably the CD Saturday shows will be starting. The Comox CD Saturday, yes. the Nymo CD Saturday, yeah. Duncan CD Saturday, Victoria CD Saturday, CD Sunday. When you can buy seeds that are absolutely not <laughs> sprayed in this country. Correct. Yes, yeah, so if you want to grow your own food. Um. <laughs> is that your bell? <laughs> no, no, we've got, we got about two minutes okay. left. I'm thinking of what's the wrap up question around all this one. When you look back on 40 years, do you see a progress of the public becoming more aware of these things? Yes, I have been discouraged and frustrated for many years. And I did notice in, you know, very slowly that it's really coming in the mainstream. It's not so much about GMOs anymore, although right. industry is really working really hard at it just to keep yes. that smoke screen going. You may or may not know that there was a movie playing here in Nanaimo last night. It's called Food Evolution. Okay. Yeah. Food Evolution is a, an hour and 25 minutes long yeah. propaganda piece from Monsanto. Oh. Oh. Nothing else. <laughs> so yeah. someone 
chose to show the Monsanto yes, corporate movie. Of course. To get the public yeah. to understand. Yeah, I mean, it. I'm yeah. Monsanto so, is nowhere to be seen, of course, in the movie, but obviously yeah. that's what it is. So, so to bring this down to the personal level, you are now working on an, an operating farm, right? In his, in his free in his free farm is a sort of a funny farm. Yeah. We are a teach. Yeah, you know, we teach. Okay. Basically, we have apprentices and we have courses and workshops. And what are you teaching on in his free? It's Innisfree. mostly my wife, and she teaches medicinal plants. Oh, okay. Medical herbalism. Yeah. How to heal and how to maintain your health with medicinal plants, and of course nutrition. Yeah. That's. Are you good poet? Are you good at reading poetry? You do. I'll oh, do it. You no, have, you have I have action. it here because the farm, your Innisfree, comes from the poem by, it does. by Yeats, right? Which your farm is named after. And it's, um, it's lyrically beautiful. It says, um, it's called the Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. Droppings from the veils of morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. Makes you want to be there, doesn't it? I will arise and go now, for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. <laughs> you say it really well. So Yeats clearly, his spirit is on your farm, right? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, yeah. for, for joining us. Thank you for your leadership in this particular realm of getting us educated about all this. My name is Guy Dauncey. This has been the show called Change the World. One of my small contributions is this book called Journey to the Future, set in Vancouver in the year 2032. It's a novel when people are living out a world in which all food is grown organically, all energy is 100% renewable, democracy is strong, street life is strong, and we're enjoying a positive future. And if you like this show, tune in next week and you'll have another scintillating guest. And thanks for watching.